Ah, uh, sometimes if you stand way back here, he won't do it, but... We have to see through the Matrix. We did it! The original cast on crit, low life, assassin with Ice Nova, Cosby's Malice, Prism Guardian, Shavs, all that, the classic, is probably the first build that I remember playing that really opened up the game to me and made me realize that Path of Exile could be really smooth and fun, kind of was unlocking the arcadey, fast zoomer playstyle for me. Before that, I had played a lot of other builds that were pretty fun and pretty solid and effective. But there's something about just cast on crit, cyclone, really big spells, blowing up everything, and just feeling like you're a hot knife cutting through butter. And that to me is kind of the quintessential soul of what makes Path of Exile particularly so fun. And then when you find a build that fun, you want to throw a lot of currency at it and really upgrade it because it's just so nice seeing how far you can push it. What this is, is me trying to revisit that nostalgic build. I originally started out wanting to do some sort of blade fall, blade blast with the new Blade Fall of, uh, or Blade Blast of Unloading. And I kind of at the last minute called an audible. Right off the bat, I will say that this is a build that is entirely enabled by the current charm system in the game. Without the charms, without that which was taken, without the easy accessibility of a mage blood, also arguably the most broken item and most broken combination of items in the game right now, the Badge of Brotherhood, Malachi's Loop, and the core of all that, the Raw Cash and Patience. All of those together is really kind of the core of what's enabling this build. Um, in addition to the charms, allowing us to cap our accuracy, spell suppression, get area effect, all of that good stuff that we care about for a cast on crit build. This build can basically do everything in the game. Um, it can delete Ubers in just a number of seconds. It can do 10,000 Wisp, Delirious, full, giant, juiced, crazy maps. It can do all of them without really dying pretty much ever. It has good baseline defenses. It has really good baseline recovery. As long as you're not walking over a lot of degens without any monsters to hit to get that life gain on hit, you should pretty much never die. I leveled this character up to level 100 without dying very much at all. Just doing maps. Don't do five ways anymore. Those are a waste of time. <laughs> Juiced maps are insane XP right now. And yeah, it was just really nice kind of revisiting a build that kind of kicked off my love for Path of Exile. And in fact, the very first build that I ever shared on this uh, this YouTube channel here was a Cast on Crit Ice Nova Elementalist. And it's really nice to go back to that. All right, so here is my level 100 Assassin. I am so triggered right now. He was originally gonna be a trigger bot setup, uh, but unfortunately trigger bots were really, really uncomfortable. I didn't like that they lagged behind you. And so I ended up just going regular Assassin instead of any Saboteur or Forbidden Flesh and Flame setup. The core concept of the build is a Cyclone Cast on Crit uh, set up here using a Frostbolt or a Trigger on Frostbolt spell. So what we have is Cyclone linked with Awaken Cast on Crit. Awaken Cast on Crit is mandatory and you really want this as high level as possible. Level 6 would be even better. The reason for that is you get increased cooldown recovery rate with a uh, higher level Cast on Crit. And every little bit makes a big difference in your itemization for your charms trying to get that cooldown recovery rate. If you don't know how Cast on Crit works, just first off, uh, watch my cast on crit video. You should really know the fundamentals of this before you try to put together this build. You have to understand uh, accuracy, hit chance, crit chance, crit multi, all of that, as well as the cooldown recovery rate and attack rate breakpoints. Cast on crit is really like baby's first advanced build. It's an archetype that requires you to understand some of the mathematical complexity behind the veil of the all the uh, opaque systems here. So we have Cyclone linked with cast on crit. Then we have that linked with, originally, Ice Nova of Frostbolts. So the way that this works is we're using Cosprey's Malice, and 
This is a sword that says trigger a socketed cold spell on melee critical strike with a 0.25 second cooldown. So that means four times a second, you know, as long as we're attacking quickly enough with our cyclone and we're critting every single time, we will be triggering the spell that is in this weapon. And the spell that we put in here is Frostbolt that is then linked with GMP and Greater Volley because we want as many Frostbolts as possible. And we'll go into that in a second. So if I don't have my cast on crit set up right here, let's remove cast on crit and just show you what this looks like with Cyclone and the Cosprey's Malice. So when I hit an enemy, it'll spawn my Frost Bolts, and you can see I spawn quite a few, and this can summon them up to four times a second. So with the number of Frost Bolts that we have, you can see that I currently fire 11 Frost Bolts every single trigger, so that is 44 Frost Bolts per second that are spawned. Why do I need that many Frost Bolts? Well, let's actually go back to the basics a little bit here first. The traditional version of this build, where this all comes from, Historically, the original Ice Nova before this league, before Transfigured Gems, had a cast on Frostbolt component to it. So when you triggered Ice Nova, it could cast on multiple Frostbolts, and that would be a multiplier on your damage. So what that means is I can do something like this. I can put my Ice Nova right here. Let's, uh, let's put Frostbolt over here. I can cast Frostbolt, and then I can cast Ice Nova on those Frostbolts. As long as I have four Frostbolts on the screen, my Ice Nova can expand on up to four of them. That is a 4x damage multiplier. And that was always the traditional setup. This league, they changed a little bit where the regular, the non-transfigured Ice Nova does not trigger off of Frostbolt, but you can get this transfigured gem that does. And this Ice Nova is actually better than the original one. It does more damage than previously. So this is what I was originally playing. So the conceit here is we have our Frostbolt on our sword. Then we have cast on crit with our Ice Nova. And if we see what this looks like, let's put on an MTX. So you can see the Ice Nova very clearly. The uh, Frost Bolts will go out, and then you can see the Ice Novas, these big blue rings. These are expanding off of the Frost Bolts. And that's a 4x damage multiplier. And like you can see that the Frost Bolts stay on the screen, and they can, keep, uh, they can keep spawning. So now you're asking me, why are you summoning 11 Frost Bolts? That seems like overkill. You only need 4 on the screen at a time. And this is where it gets really interesting, at least compared... If you played the original version... This was very interesting to me and very fun. We were looking at the Transfigured Gems, and I don't know if it was someone in chat or we were just looking through the gems, suggested checking out the Vortex of Projection. So previously, Vortex always had a cooldown, and Vortex was changed this league to have a cast time, so kind of killed Cold Dot. People don't really want to do that anymore. However, the Transfigured Vortex of Projection is really, really interesting. If we try to compare apples to apples here, Vortex of Projection versus Ice Nova Frostbolts. Let's just go line by line. The first thing that you'll see that's huge, effectiveness of added damage, 270 versus 130 on the Ice Nova. So that means that I get over double the effectiveness of added damage for every damage that I add. So every one damage that I add to Ice Nova, I get 1.3 damage. But for every one damage I add to Vortex, I get 2.7. It is way, way more effective for adding flat damage to it and then let's look at the actual damage numbers, 880 to 1320 and 659 to 988. It's not even close. The amount of actual base damage that the Vortex does is insane, and the effect of added damage is crazy. Okay, why would you ever use Ice Nova? What is the compelling reason for Ice Nova to even exist in this situation? Ice Nova expands from up to four Frostbolt projectiles, whereas Vortex of Projection explodes from five Frostbolt projectiles. What that explode means is it actually consumes the Frostbolt. Both Vortex and Ice Nova do 50% more damage when cast on Frostbolt. So if you can cast on Frostbolt, it's a it's just 50% more damage, which is crazy. And then it can go up to five Frostbolts, so it's 50% more damage and 500% more on top of that. And the actual way that the damage works here is kind of interesting, where the Vortexes kind of expand and explode off of the Frostbolts as they collide with the monsters. It's a very unique interaction that we don't see kind of anywhere else in the game that I know of, whereas uh, Ice Nova will just expand immediately off of the Vortex, or rather off of the uh, the Frostbolts as it's happening. So yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting interaction and mechanic here. But the key here is, like as we saw, is Vortex itself is doing very, very huge damage. And uh, if you want to see it delete a monster, it'll just do that. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. It feels really, really good. I mean, we can just toss it in an Uber. Why not? Yeah, and just to show this on an Uber, this is Uber Exarch right here. Uh, we want to cast Zealotry. We want to cast Cold Snap. That's our Bone Chill. We're manually freezing him right here. 
And an actual estimate of damage is kind of tough to do because, uh, you know, the way that the Frost Bolts are exploding... That was Uber, by the way. <laughs> um, the way that the Frost Bolts are exploding off of the... Or rather, the way that the Vortexes are exploding off of the Frost Bolts, it's not exactly 50 times a second. It, it relies on them colliding with the monsters. Oh, I didn't even have precision on right there. I was actually missing a bunch of hits. <laughs> my real damage is actually much higher than that. I forgot my aura was off. But in terms of map clear, especially when all of the Frost Bolts are hitting all of the enemies... They're all exploding. Your Frostbolt, if you're doing like really juice maps, all the Frostbolts will be disappearing and exploding pretty much constantly um, in, your, in a very high density map. It's pretty incredible. All right, and here's a quick little Uber Cirrus with Ice Nova just to, to, I don't have the other key for Exarch, so I can't really do apples to apples here. But just to compare, um, you can see that the Ice Nova damage is solid, but it's not as chunky. Let's see if I can survive this. Let's put in... Vortex right here. Where is Cirrus? And that's... <laughs> Hopefully you can tell the difference. Um, the Vortex damage is much, much more than Ice Nova. Hopefully that can kind of demonstrate it. <laughs> it's tough, tough to show in a quick little back-to-back apples-to-apples. But anyway. Yeah, just being able to explode Vortex from up to five Frost Bolts at a time. I think I already said a number of times uh, as I'm recording this. It is very important to understand that this is a build that is enabled by arguably the most broken item in the game right now, particularly this combination of Badge of the Brotherhood, Malachi's Loop, and Ralakesh and Patience, and then utilizing charms. These are critical to making up for all of the stats that you have to scale for cast on crit, namely area of effect, critical strike chance, accuracy, as well as stats and spell suppression. It, like Charms do pretty much everything. And then the easy availability of a Mage Blood only being 90 Divines at time of recording, um, and it being very easy to make 20, 30 plus Divines an hour for even the most casual Elk and Go player at the moment. This is a very easy to put together build right now. I think there's a very special moment in time where we can revisit an old archetype and just see how awesome and special it really was. Like, this is more powerful than the build ever was in the past. It does something very special where it's like putting on the rose-colored glasses and it's just as good, if not better, than you remember. Which is something that usually doesn't happen when you revisit something in the past. You put in that bad dude's cartridge in your NES and you just kind of wonder, how did I ever have fun playing this game? <laughs> it doesn't stand the test of time like, uh, you know, Mario Brothers. However, this build, at least right now, feels like it kind of does. So also, starting off, I do want to say... I currently have invested about three mirrors into my build, but I will be sharing below a path of building that is very stripped down. This is an estimate of about mage blood plus 100 divines. You know, in this league at this point, it's not that expensive. It's not that hard to get. You know, that's probably the equivalent of like 50 divines in another league. So as a, for an end game build, I think it's pretty achievable. In the stripped down budget version, you know, budget, it's still doing about 80 million DPS, still relatively defensive. I really, really stripped things down. A one mod watcher's eye. I mean, you can't even get a one mod watcher's eye. <laughs> I stripped everything down to the, the bare minimum. No double corrupted items. This is even with a level 20 vortex of projection, not 21. All level five awakened gems, nothing level six, nothing like that. Everything is tuned down a lot and it's still very, very solid doing 80 million DPS. I'm going to show you my fun, cool stuff that I have that's really expensive right now, but the budget stuff is here for you. And just to show you what the high-end POB looks like right now, this is with my high-end uh, gear. I'm at 171.5 million DPS at the moment, and there's more that I could do. Like, I don't have everything perfectly double-corrupted or anything, but I do have some really, really good stuff. So let's start off with the core of what makes this build work. I went over the idea of we have cast on crit with the vortex. We have the frost bolt with the cost breeze. We're cycloning. You know, we're just using cyclone right here. If you know how cast on crit works, please watch the video if you don't know the fundamentals. But the idea is you want to attack 10.1 times a second. And you can see that I'm exactly 10.1 times a second with a 52% cooldown recovery rate. Those numbers are very important. You need exactly those numbers. You can get more CDR, but not the attack speed. I have 100% hit chance. I have 100% crit chance on my Cyclone. And I'm attacking four times a second, which is triggering four sets of Frost Bolts per second on my Cost Breeze. I'm triggering 11 Frost Bolts at a time, so I am creating 44 Frost Bolts per second. I recognize that the POB DPS here is not exactly accurate because it is assuming that I'm triggering 50 Frost Bolts a second, so it's a little bit less in real life here, we have include in full DPS Vortex and count five for triggering off of five Vortexes at a time. 
So what we're doing is we're using the combination of Rolikesh and Patience. This is the number one item on the chopping block right now. It is super broken. If you are not abusing Rolikesh and Patience, particularly with Badge of the Brotherhood and Malachi's Loop this league, you are missing out. There's a lot of build archetypes right now that are taking advantage of this. It is a crazy combination. How cheaply accessible this combination is for how much power that you get. It's really special. So the way that it works is you count as having the max number of Endurance Frenzy and Power Charges. You don't actually have the max, so you can't spend them with Discharge or anything like that, but you count as if you have them. So all of the bonuses that say stuff like Spell Damage per Power Charge or anything like that, all of these will count for your build as if you have the maximum. We then combine that with Badge of the Brotherhood, which says your Frenzy Charges is equal to your max Power Charges. And so what we do is we stack the number of power charges that we can get on our build. We get the plus three on the passive tree. We get another plus two on the Malachi's loop. And then we get additional wherever we can. Ideally, you get double plus one max power charge rings if you can. And you get spell damage per power charge, all that type of stuff. Because we're an assassin, we get an additional plus one right here. So I actually have a total of 10 power charges, which says that I also have a total of 10 frenzy charges. And I also count as I have the three endurance charges, which is nice for res and PDR. And then because of that, we can do things like Disciple of the Slaughter. You get 8% increased damage per frenzy charge. That's 80% increased damage for our anoint right here. We take things like uh, Disciple of the Forbidden, damage per power charge, crit multi per power charge, and so on and so forth. It's the regular charge stacking thing, which has always been around. But in the past, you've had to have a way of generating power and frenzy charges to even matter. Nothing just said you have the max and you count as having the max. And with the new Rolikesh, you can combine that. Then with Malachi's Loop, we get 16% spell damage per power charge, which is 160% increased spell damage with the plus two max power charge that it comes with. Because we're Eldritch Battery, we actually really like the bonus energy shield on here. It's a very cheap item, so we can double corrupt this, go for Fizz Taken As, reduce area damage, makes us tankier. And then the downside shocks when you reach max power charges, we are fully ailment immune using a storm shroud. So we don't care about any ailments whatsoever. We're using a double corrupted lightning coil. So here's the other really nice benefit of using Vortex over Ice Nova is Ice Nova does not have a duration component. Whereas Vortex still has a leftover duration tag on the Vortex of Projection. It still has a base duration and a cold damage over second, even though it's very, very little. And so that duration tag allows us to target socketed AOE and socketed duration on a lightning coil and get plus four level on our lightning coil right here, which gives us really good PDR and it gives us plus four levels on our, uh, our vortex right here. And as we all know, gem levels are one of the best ways to scale damage on a spell. Like I said earlier, mage bloods are currently only 90 divines. They are basically free. I got my mage blood by opening Valdo's boxes and running them at myself. So, you know, kind of earned it, <laughs> I guess. But yeah, at 90 divines, you know, you can very easily make 20, 30 divines an hour. Check out my Elva farming guide if you don't know how to do that. Locus of Corruption Elva temples right now are selling at five divines each. You can make easily three to four of those an hour. Extrapolate that out. You only have to farm for a few hours and you can buy a mage blood. The helmet is primarily a defensive helmet. The double fist taken as you can get damage per power charge as well, which is really nice. And then you get spell suppression, res, life. Um, really, really like a helmet like this. This helps our defense a lot. Similarly on the gloves, most important thing is suppress spell damage res, life, all of that. What I did here is you'll see that I have the temple mod with the increased damage against chilled enemies. I bought this with just the suffixes originally, and then I did suffixes can't be changed, veiled chaos orb until I veiled uh, socket of AOE gems. This is a lot cheaper than buying a fractured temple mod and trying to craft it up later. Just try to find good suffixes and then, or even two good suffixes, you can go for a YOLO annul, something like that. It'll save you a lot of money instead of buying the like 50, 100 divine fractured bases. But honestly, even without the temple mod on the gloves, I think I took it out on here, right? In the budget setup. Let's see, in the budget setup, we are not using a temple mod. So that's taken out. So you don't have to worry about that. No big deal. In fact, let's even drop the plus two off of the, uh, the gloves right here. We don't need that. Barely affects our damage. Minus 600K, boom. So in fact, let's actually just strip this down all the way. Don't get, don't get confused about that random magic find. So yeah, about as basic as it gets on the gloves. The gloves are not important to the build whatsoever. Just a little bit of bonus damage if you want it, but the unnerve and the spell suppression is really nice. For the rings, I really, really like Onslaught on hit. I think that by itself shouldn't be too expensive. And also I totally recognize that as soon as I make this video, everything gets kind of wacky and the price gets uh, awful, but... Yeah, there's a bunch of them right now. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I already hate that the price gets crazy, but just Onslaught on hit, 
There's a bunch of them at 10 divines, uh, 10, 15 divines, 77 rings. So that's the most important thing. Um, onslaught on hit, this will give us 20% increased attack speed, which helps us reach that 10.1 attacks per second breakpoint for the cast on crit. Accuracy, damage while leeching, all that's okay. Uh, life gain on hit, I really recommend that. Life gain on hit is huge for sustainability. And crit multi is the other mod that we really care about. My other ring, I mirrored this from Sushi's shop. Unfortunately, all plus one max power charge rings that have more than one implicit have been taken by all of the mirror crafters, uh, TFT, etc. Unfortunately, if you search for plus power charge, crit multi base, or anything, TFT has already slurped it up, so we don't have access to these bases. And they're all up for mirror service, unfortunately. They're all mirror service. You can't buy bases. I would have loved to craft my own. Unfortunately, they're very highly desired for Penance Brand build. So like, this is actually set up for Penance Brand. I don't care about cast speed. Uh, I don't care about mana at all. But unfortunately, this is the option. What I recommend doing, however, is if you do want to get my exact same ring, you can get my exact same ring, is you can mirror it and go to Sushi's Settler Shop right here. You can go to Jewelry right here. And what I did is the Hypnotic Whorl which is this iron ring right here. I did ask them to change the catalyst to life instead of caster, just for more life and mana for our build. That's the best catalyst for this setup for us here. Plus one curse badge of the brotherhood. I bought this for like 200 divines, I think. Instead, you can just take whispers of doom. You don't need a plus one curse, but you know, it saves us four passive points. So that is a really, really big upgrade if you can get it. I do recommend if you want to buy every single badge of the brotherhood, hit it with a vol orb and try to make one of these. Very, very big upgrade for the build. Malachi's loop, ideal is double fist taken as, reduced area damage is also really good. And the cost freeze malice. So cost freeze malice, most important thing here is that attack speed. Make that 14% attack speed. That's very important for reaching the 10.1 attack speed breakpoint. It's a lot, lot harder if this local attack speed is any lower. Then after that, you do want the flat damage numbers as high as possible. So, you know, 100 to 200, 60 to 110. That makes a really big difference. As we know, um, Vortex has a very big effectiveness of added damage. So any flat damage that we get from the sword is really big for the build. And then the ideal implicits, I did buy this for a mirror. The ideal implicits here are plus one proj for more frost bolts and damage pens. Honestly, you can get away with not even using the pen implicit. The default implicit of crit multi is totally fine. Penetrate is only a couple percent more damage. It's not a big deal. Most important thing is the attack speed and the flat damage. This is just an absolute luxury. You do not need the sword whatsoever. All right, the Ascendancy, obviously we take the Primalist because this is a charm-based build. Now, there are a number of options. Your most important thing here because you're a cast and crit build is getting that 100% chance to crit. You want this on both your Cyclone and your spells. Your spell crit, you'll actually get a lot easier because we do take some spell crit uh, nodes on the passive tree. However, attack crit, we're not directly scaling that in any way, although we do have a ton of power charges. So that's the most important thing you want to look for. You want your Cyclone to say 100% chance to crit, and you want this to say 100% chance to crit in your hideout. Don't rely on POB because Assassin's Mark is going to kind of throw that number off. You always want this at 100% chance. And so what you want to do is focus on getting a Watcher's Eye. Most important thing is just hatred with critical strike chance. That's the most important thing. I have a really good Watcher's Eye, but um, that's the one line that you care about right there. And then you can actually get charms here that give you critical strike chance while at max power charges. Since we always count as max power charges, just stack these as much as you need to get that crit chance. Besides that, for the charms, there's a lot of stuff that you can kind of mix and match. I went for strength and intelligence. I went for spell suppression. I got some accuracy here if I've dealt a crit recently. I have area of effect. You can also, like I said, you can stack res. You can stack critical strike chance. You can also go for recovery and even more AoE. This morning, I actually swapped out this AoE and recovery for more spell suppression and accuracy right here. I was previously using this 50% more accuracy at close range mastery, but by taking this charm, I was able to drop that. So um, this is just the balancing act of playing cast and crit, accuracy, crit chance for both cyclone and your spells, crit multi, etc., cetera, um, as well as your cooldown recovery rate and your attack rate. I'm just going to keep harping on that. You got to balance all these numbers. You got to make sure you're hitting all of those exact breakpoints the way that you need. All right, as I'm editing here, I just wanted to really, really clarify the concept and affordability of things like charms and you're that which was taken. We were talking about this on stream yesterday. People were looking for cooldown recovery rate with crit chance on the that which was taken. The way that you can think about this is your charms and that which was taken are kind of the same bucket. If you're a Diablo 4 player, you know all about buckets. <laughs> Looks like they just pissed in a bucket for uh, season three of Diablo 4. But anyway, if you search for cooldown recovery rate and crit chance at max power charges right now, 
people are kind of price fixing that was that which was taken few up at like one mirror i don't know if people are trying to price fix my already or whatever what you can do is just look at the actual stats and nodes that you need so in my version of the build i have strength and intelligence you can see i need strength and intelligence in my build instead of having that on one of my charms right here is i can move that over to my that which was taken actually let me put this where my storm shroud is so it's a lot easier to compare them apples to apples right next to each other all of the modifiers that i have on my charm and on my that which was taken they're the exact same roles so you can search for damage penetrates cooldown recovery rate crit chance and move them between each other and try to find the cheapest versions of all of these things if you're clever about how you move these modifiers around i recognize that people are just going to try to copy paste from pob and that's what they get for not watching the video you can just find these modifiers the crit chance of max power charges is not that expensive on a charm but it is more expensive on a that which was taken so you can just go for strength and intelligence area effect power charge spell suppression whatever on your jewel move them over to your charms and just find the cheapest combination i promise you can find something that's cheaper than some mirror tier that which was taken the only reason is being priced at a mirror is because people are not being clever about finding the right combination and it jacks the price up when people are just trying to copy paste POBs. Don't be that. You are smarter than that. I believe in you. All right, back to the original video. For the Timeless Jewel, you will use a Militant Faith that is converted by High Templar Dominus. I do recommend area damage and elemental damage per 10 devotion if you can. Not a really big deal. We don't get that much devotion whatsoever, but it's a little bit of a bonus. We do get 40 devotions. So 12% area damage and LE damage is pretty good. So, you know, we get 24% damage here, which is pretty nice. But the most important thing is you don't want to brick Cruel Prep or Instability and you want inner conviction right here so what you're going to do is just search for militant faith uh with area damage and elemental damage and you can copy paste it from the trade website now this is kind of like the budget way to do this but i found that the interface on the timeless jewel search for militant faith was kind of janky so we want to just do this search for militant faith click search right here then you can click the magnifying glass and what we want is ideally we want to say per, we can say like area devotion, right? And it'll just show up. Then we can say elemental devotion. This will show up right here, elemental damage. And you could do other ones. There's like elemental res, there's stuff like that, which is nice. And this one, we want Dominus, our good buddy Dominus. So we want to look at any of these. And then what you can do, and they, unfortunately, apparently the price of these is not as cheap as I would like, but you can click the copy symbol right here, go to your POB, control V, it'll show up, add to build. And then you can just swap to that militant faith and you can then look in your POB and see if it bricks any of your nodes that you care about. And you can see right here, it does. This actually transformed my life node to plus one to max res if you have 150 devotion. And this especially doesn't matter because we're only getting 40 devotion anyway. So this is a very dead node and we don't want this. So I would recommend just going down the line, click the copy right here, go to the next one, put it in, control V, put that one in. I think it's this one double check the tree. Unfortunately, this one's even worse, right? This one transformed both of these. Anyway, I would recommend going down the line, making sure that it doesn't transform a node that you care about. And you can just do this. Also, what you can do is we have another node that we can swap it into. We can put it here where the storm shot is. So you can check two different nodes here. So turn this one off and then right here, put it in here and see if this one works and does not transform anything you care about. So it does transform this one. But you can take Inner Conviction here instead of at Hexmaster. You can do it at Ghost Dance. This is a way you can check two different nodes. You have a lot of different choices right here. Just try to find the Militant Faith that is good for your build. I strongly recommend using a Sapphire, Topaz, and Ruby Flask. This will make you take way, way less. You take 38% less Fire, Cold, and Lightning damage just off the top in addition to your elemental res. That combined with spell suppression makes you take very, very little damage from spells. It's a gigantic defensive layer for us right here. And particularly because we have lightning coil and fizz taken as on our shield and our helmet, this actually makes our physical damage mitigation even better. I have a pure movement speed Quicksilver. You can replace this if you just want pure defense with like a Jade Flask, Evasion and all that, we are evasion based. If you're using a Mage Blood and you want to be a Zoomer, you don't want to walk around really slowly. Do not use an Enkindled Silver Flask. It will immediately make you do too much attacks per second. It just gives you way too much attack speed. So I don't recommend that. Although if you had like a very slow sword, I guess you could do that, but you'd be walking slower. Don't recommend it. However, if you can't yet afford a Progenesis, Progenesis is not too expensive. The price is going down. It's down to 35 Divines. But if you can't afford it yet, the number one recommendation right here is a Taste of Hate. 
This actually does a really good job for our defenses. In the budget setup, you see we still have a solid defensive layer right here, even with just a taste of hate. It, we don't need a progenesis, but a progenesis does make it you know, noticeably better because it's a broken flask. If you don't care about defense, you can use a dying sun. This will give you two more frost bolts. This will help you min-max your damage. However, if you do use a Taste of Hate or a Dying Sun, I do recommend replacing your Sapphire or Ruby Flask. You're kind of missing some of the value here. You're not going to be stacking that properly. We use a Storm Shroud. One of our flasks, we do need chance to avoid being shocked on here. With at least 52% chance to avoid being shocked, with a perfectly enkindled flask on your Mage Blood, with a Storm Shroud, you are now fully elemental ailment immune. So that's great. I recommend one of your jewels having Corrupted Blood on it. So you're Corrupted Blood immune. Bleed is dealt with by Steel Skin. For all of our small jewels, I recommend just going ham on crit multi. Make sure you hit that attack speed breakpoint. A little bit of energy shield gain per attack is actually really nice. And I have a little bit of mana reservation here. This is actually a very, very cheap jewel, but it allows me to hit my attack speed breakpoint. I just have one of these right here, which is really nice. Other than that, you want to go for, these are expensive jewels. These are like 50 divines each, but you want to go for tons of crit multi. And then ideally some life on top of that is really good. So these are kind of like your mid-max jewels if you want to go for those. For your large cluster jewels, I recommend one with Blanketed Snow, Blast Freeze, and Widespread Destruction. Just one Blast Freeze is really nice for Freeze Proliferation, really good for Hail Device uh, Explosion Proliferation, a little bit of AoE from Widespread Destruction, and then Blanketed Snow is our best in slot for DPS. And then for our other one, it is Pure Damage. We are Blanketed Snow and Sadist. For Sadist, you do want to craft a little bit of Fire and Lightning Damage on one of your rings because we have 100% crit chance. We have always ignited and shocked recently, so we get the full 60% increased damage from Sadist. So really, really good value there. And then Disorienting Display, because we are evasion-based, is really good. We're using elemental skills all of the time, so with Frostblink, Frostbite, all of that. So enemies are basically blinded all of the time, which is really nice. Now, this is actually a really fun thing that I'm not really seeing anyone else doing at the moment which is just using an immutable force without Blood Notch. We are evasion-based. You know, we don't want to take too many hits. And we're chilling and freezing all the time. Not many incoming hits are happening, but we do not want to ever get stunned. Getting stunned is the worst feeling if you're ever playing, a, particularly a Cyclone Cast and Crit build. You just know how bad it is. To the point where in the past, I've gone full armor-based and all of that, and then go for Unwavering Stance just to be fully stun immune. I believe the breakpoint number is 963%. If you could get a 963% or greater immutable force, which is really cheap right now, this will effectively make you stun immune. You are technically getting stunned, so anything that would interrupt something that requires you to do it in a like a channeling setup to like get stacks or something, that would interrupt. But we don't care about that whatsoever. For all intents and purposes, we do feel 100% stun immune, and you don't feel any hitches or anything, and it feels perfect. So yeah, just a nice immutable force slapped in your build will make you feel stun immune. And I actually think this is tech that I'm going to be throwing in my builds a lot in the future, even without Blood Notch, because this allows us to use different Pantheons. The problem with Brian King is it kind of sucks, <laughs> right? Brian King is just there to make sure that you don't get stun or block recovery locked, right? This just gives you a two-second immunity to stun and block recovery uh, every time you get stunned, but you're still going to take that full stun. You get a little bit of stun block recovery. In modern PoE, we basically always get fully elemental ailment immune. We're using a Storm Shroud. So the other two parts of it, the chance to avoid being frozen and reduced effect of chill, do absolutely nothing for this build whatsoever. And we would much rather use a different Pantheon that gives us way more. Like Lunaris is absolutely incredible for super juice maps. Ericali is actually incredible to make up for my chaos resistance right here. Um, I do have Max Chaos Res with Progenesis up, but if Progenesis isn't up and I'm walking through, if I'm poisoned or I'm walking over Desecrated Ground or anything like that, I effectively have Max Chaos Res against any damage over time. And that's just really, really nice for like the biggest weaknesses of those builds. I like Eric Holly and Shikari right here, um, particularly if you don't have Progenesis yet, uh, for making up for the like, how difficult it is to Max or Chaos Res on this build. And then I give honorable mention to Lunars and Growth Cool right here. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the jewels. That's the passive right here. The passive tree is very standardized. You know, we're going spell suppression. We're going for crit multi. We're going for crit chance. We have to hit all three plus max power charges. Nothing really special to speak home about right here. You can take this 50% more accuracy at close range mastery, which is really, really nice if you are still struggling to get your accuracy up. But other than that, I think this is a pretty solid passive tree. For the ascendancy, you want deadly infusion, unstable infusion, opportunistic. 
Now, you can use Ambush and Assassinate. This will give you 15% more damage against monsters below 50% life, as well as Critical Strike. So it's really good for min-maxing your single target damage. If you just want a boss, Ambush and Assassinate is best in slot. However, for really juice mapping and just quality of life, I think Mistwalker is incredible. So we have increased elusive effect from our Badge of the Brotherhood right here. And since it's 10% per power charge, that's 100% increased effective elusive. And we get elusive on critical strike. We get another 50% increased elusive effect. So we actually start off at 250% increased elusive effect. So it's really, really strong right off the bat, right? We're avoiding tons of damage from hits. We get a ton of movement speed. And then this will reduce over time. And then we're immediately going to go back to 250. So, you know, it's a slow degradation. Hits zero, goes back to 250. You're always elusive, which means you're also crit immune. Crit immune, I think, is a great defensive layer. I think Mistwalker is just the best choice right here. Or you could even Forbidden Flame and Flesh, you know, one of your Assassin nodes and take the one that you're not using. And that's a cheap option as well. And in fact, if you're still using really, really budget jewels, I think that's a great option just to grab one of these nodes. I think that's actually a really smart choice. Then for the gems and the weapon, Frostbolt with ideally Awakened GMP. We want as many projectiles as possible. Greater Volley right here. I'm using Vitality to enable my Watcher's Eye. You could drop Vitality if you wanted to. If you're only using a level 3 Enlightened, you can just get a low-level Vitality. A little bit more life regen is nice. We are using Divine Blessing Zealotry to get our more damage from the Zealotry right there. Level 21 Frostblade is the most important thing right there. Cold Snap with Bone Chill and Frostlink. We have these three linked. So Bone Chill says that enemies chilled by supported skills take increased damage by that chill effect. So as we're mapping, Frostlink will be chilling the enemies, and that's going to be giving us a little bit more damage on the chilled enemies. But it's not going to be a gigantic chill. Frostblink's not hitting really, really hard. However, Cold Snap has a 23% more effective chill for its quality. So ideally, you want a 23% Cold Snap that is linked to the Bone Chill right here. So before you do single target, you do want to cast Cold Snap, and that will give you a lot more damage. If you want to min-max this, you can use Awakened Unbound Ailments with the Bone Chill. If you can drop Vitality or something like that, that will make your chill effect much, much stronger. But I think that's you know kind of overkill. We're already doing so much damage. I'm running Grace Precision Hatred with a level 4 Enlightened right now. Then I'm running Steel Skin on left click, Assassin's Mark with Mark on hit, and Herald of Ice. So Herald of Ice is not giving us a ton of damage, but it does make our clear really, really nice in combination with Blast Freeze with all of the Freeze Prolif. And it's particularly good because we have so much base critical strike chance that our Herald of Ice actually has over 50% chance to crit. So Herald of Ice is critting itself freezing enemies, and proliferating those freezes. So it's really good for just exploding the entire screen. Then the body armor, we have Cyclone, cast on crit. Awakened cast on crit is necessary. You can't use the regular one. Um, just buy a level 5 cast on crit ASAP. Vortex of projection. I d higher the level, the better. Awakened cold pen, awakened Ellie focus, and awakened added cold damage. So when I'm mapping, I actually replace awakened Ellie focus. When we're mapping, we don't want Ellie focus because we're not inflicting chill and freeze. Power charge on crit is the best gem to replace that with. So we're getting 40% more damage off this gem because we have 10 power charges. And this allows us to chill and freeze with our vortex, which just makes the map clear and proliferation much, much better. So you do want to swap that right there. And then Awakened Added Cold. So this is our gem links right there. A couple things to call out as well in addition. Things you can swap in. Vol Righteous Fire, you can just pop that in if you want to. 19% more spell damage. It only lasts 4 seconds. Doesn't last very long. It's annoying to press an additional button. In the time that it took you to press Righteous Fire, you could have just killed the enemy. This build does so much damage. I think it's just overkill. And then this. I don't want anyone to call me out and say that, Oh, you should have used the Adorned. Because <laughs> uh, if you're spending all that money, you should just use the Adorned. I totally recognize the Adorned is insane. The Adorned is an absolutely broken jewel. This is best in slot for many, many builds in the game right now. Um, but as you can see, buying a perfect Adorned, I know you don't need a perfect one. Like 120, 130 is still fine. But anyway, like a high level Adorned, a really good one is very, very expensive. And the most annoying part is you have to craft the jewels for it. And getting jewels, particularly that are better than the really good ones that I have right now, is just going to be annoying. Ideally, you want synth jewels that have really good implicits, and then you have a perfect prefix and a perfect suffix. And that way, you can get 150% increased effect, so you're basically getting 2.5x on all of your jewels. So at the cost of one of your jewels, as long as you're using two other really good magic jewels, the Adorned is already just better for your build. So for me, this is more of just a laziness thing rather than me not knowing that it's there. It's just going to be a pain in the butt to craft all the perfect jewels for it, and it's a lot easier, as you can see, right? 
I am balancing a lot of little things, little quality of life things, ES on hit, little mana reservation, attack speed, stuff like that. A lot easier to balance if you're using rare jewels that you can just hit those exact breakpoint numbers. Whereas the adorned, it's it's a lot swingier and it's a lot harder to craft those jewels. So that's the reason why I'm not using it. I, I totally recognize if you want to take this build to the absolute extreme, that is the right choice. All right, that was a lot of rambling. I just wanted to make like a 20 minute video or so to show you guys this build that I think is super, super awesome. But uh, as always, I can't stop talking when I love a build. And I just want to share all of the nuance and everything that goes into it. Because really, at the end of the day, for me, every single one of these builds like really represents a lot of like effort and like passion towards making something that I think is just really cool. And I just want to share that with you guys. So, so yeah, if you guys are still here, thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.